Chapter 8 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka. The Fourth Lesson Mental Control, Part 1. In our first three lessons of this series, we have endeavored to bring into realization within your mind 1. The consciousness of the I, its independence from the body, its immortality, its invincibility and invulnerability. 2 the superiority of the I over the mind, as well as over the body. The fact that the mind is not the I, but is merely an instrument for the expression of the I. The fact that the I is master of the mind, as well as of the body. That the I is behind all thought. That the I can set aside for consideration the sensations, emotions, passions, desires, and the rest of the mental phenomena, and still realize that it, the I, is apart from these mental manifestations, and remains unchanged, real, and fully existent. That the I can set aside any and all of its mental tools and instruments as not I things, and still consciously realize that after so setting them aside, there remains something, itself, the I, which cannot be set aside or taken from. That the I is the master of the mind, and not its slave. 3. That the I is a much greater thing than the little personal I we have been considering it to be that the I is a part of that great one reality which pervades all the universe, that it is connected with all other forms of life by countless ties, mental and spiritual filaments and relations, that the I is a center of consciousness in that great one reality or spirit which is behind and back of all life and existence, the center of which reality or existence is the absolute or God, that the sense of reality that is inherent in the I is really the reflection of the sense of reality inherent in the whole, the great I of the universe. The underlying principle of these three lessons is the reality of the I in itself, over and above all matter, force or mind, positive to all of them, just as they are positive or negative to each other, and negative only to the center of the One, the Absolute itself. And this is the position for the candidate or initiate to take. I am positive to mind, energy and matter, and control them all. I am negative only to the Absolute, which is the center of being, of which being I am. And, as I assert my mastery over mind, energy, and matter, and exercise my will over them, so do I acknowledge my subordination to the Absolute, and gladly open my soul to the inflow of the Divine Will, and partake of its power, strength, and wisdom. In the present lesson, and those immediately following it, we shall endeavor to assist the candidate or initiate in acquiring a mastery of the subordinate manifestations, matter, energy, and mind. In order to acquire and assert this mastery, one must acquaint himself with the nature of the thing to be controlled. In our advanced course, we have endeavored to explain to you the nature of the three great manifestations known as hita or mind substance, prana or energy, and akasa or the principle of matter. We also explain to you that the eye of man is superior to these three, being what is known as atman or spirit. Matter, energy and mind as we have explained, are manifestations of the Absolute, and are relative things. The yogi philosophy 
teaches that matter is the grossest form of manifested substance, being below energy and mind, and consequently negative to and subordinate to both. One stage higher than matter is energy or force, which is positive to and has authority over matter, matter being a still grosser form of substance, but which is negative to and subordinate to mind, which is a still higher form of substance. Next in order comes the highest of the three, mind, the finest form of substance, and which dominates both energy and matter, being positive to both. Mind, however, is negative and subordinate to the I, which is spirit, and obeys the orders of the latter when firmly and intelligently given. The I itself is subordinate only to the absolute, the center of being, the I being positive and dominant over the threefold manifestation of mind, energy, and matter. The I, which for the sake of the illustration must be regarded as a separate thing, although it is really only a center of consciousness in the great body of spirit, finds itself surrounded by the triple ocean of mind, energy, and matter, which ocean extends into infinity. The body is but a physical form through which flows an unending stream of matter, for, as you know, the particles and atoms of the body are constantly changing, being renewed, replaced, thrown off, and supplanted. One's body of a few years ago, or rather the particles composing that body, have passed off, and now form new combinations in the world of matter. And one's body of today is passing away and being replaced by new particles. And one's body of next year is now occupying some other portion of space, and its particles are now parts of countless other combinations, from which space and combinations they will later come to combine and form the body of next year. There is nothing permanent about the body. Even the particles of the bones are being constantly replaced by others. And so it is with the vital energy, force, or strength of the body, including that of the brain. It is constantly being used up and expended, a fresh supply taking its place. And even the mind of the person is changeable, and the mind substance, or keta, is being used up and replenished, the new supply coming from the great ocean of mind, into which the discarded portion slips, just as is the case with the matter and energy. While the majority of our students, who are more or less familiar with the current material scientific conceptions, will readily accept the above idea of the ocean of matter and energy, and the fact that there is a continual using up and replenishing of one store of both, they may have more or less trouble in accepting the idea that mind is a substance or principle amenable to the same general laws as are the other two manifestations or attributes of substance. One is so apt to think of his mind as himself, the I, notwithstanding the fact that in our second lesson of this series we showed you that the I is superior to the mental states, and that it can set them aside and regard and consider them as not I things. Yet the force of the habit of thought is very strong and it may take some of you considerable time before you get into the way of realizing that your mind is something that you use instead of being you, yourself. And yet you must persevere in attaining this realization, for in the degree that you realize your dominance over your mind, 
so will be your control of it, and its amenability to that control. And, as is the degree of that dominance and control, so will be the character, great, and extent of the work that your mind will do for you. So, you see, realization brings control, and control brings results. This statement lies at the base of the science of Raja Yoga, and many of its first exercises are designed to acquaint the student with that realization and to develop the realization and control by habit and practice. The yogi philosophy teaches that instead of mind being the I, it is the thing through and by means of which the I thinks, at least so far as is concerned the knowledge concerning the phenomenal or outward universe, that is, the universe of name and form. There is a higher knowledge locked up in the innermost part of the I, that far transcends any information that it may receive about or from the outer world. But that is not before us for consideration at this time, and we must concern ourselves with the thinking about the world of things. Mind substance in Sanskrit is called khita, and a wave in the khita, which wave is the combination of mind and energy, is called frita, which is akin to what we call a thought. In other words, it is mind in action, whereas khita is mind in repose. Frita, when literally translated, means a whirlpool or eddy in the mind, which is exactly what a thought really is. But we must call the attention of the student at this point to the fact that the word mind is used in two ways by the yogis and other occultists, and the student is directed to form a clear concept of each meaning in order to avoid confusion, and that he may more clearly perceive the two aspects of the things which the word is intended to express. In the first place, the word mind is used as synonymous with kita, or mind substance, which is the universal mind principle. From this kita, mind substance, or mind, all the material of the millions of personal minds is obtained. The second meaning of the word mind is that which we mean when we speak of the mind of anyone, thereby meaning the mental faculties of that particular person, that which distinguishes his mental personality from that of another. We have taught you that this mind in men functions on three planes and have called the respective manifestations 1. the instinctive mind, 2. the intellect, and 3. the spiritual mind. See 14 lessons in yogi philosophy, etc. These three mental planes, taken together, make up the mind of the person, or, to be more exact, they, clustered around the eye, form the soul of the individual. The word soul is often used as synonymous with spirit, but those who have followed us will distinguish the difference. The soul is the ego, surrounded by its mental principles, while the spirit is the soul of the soul, the eye or real self. The science of Raja Yoga, to which these series of lessons is devoted, teaches, as its basic principle, the control of the mind. It holds that the first step toward power consists in obtaining a control of one's own mind. It holds that the internal world 
must be conquered before the outer world is attacked. It holds that the eye manifests itself in will, and that that will may be used to manipulate, guide, govern, and direct the mind of its owner, as well as the physical world. It aims to clear away all mental rubbish and encumbrances, to conduct a mental house-cleaning, as it were, and to secure a clear, clean, healthy mind. Then it proceeds to control that mind intelligently, and with effect, saving all waste power, and by means of concentration, bringing the mind in full harmony with the will, that it may be brought to a focus, and its power greatly increased, and its efficiency fully secured. Concentration and willpower are the means by which the yogis obtain such wonderful results, and by which they manage and direct their vigorous, healthy minds, and master the material world, acting positively upon energy and matter. This control extends to all planes of the mind, and the yogis not only control the instinctive mind, holding in subjection its lower qualities, and making use of its other parts, but they also develop and enlarge the field of their intellect, and obtain from it wonderful results. Even the spiritual mind is mastered, and aided in its unfoldment, and urged to pass down into the field of consciousness some of the wonderful secrets to be found within its area. By means of Raja Yoga, many of the secrets of existence and being, many of the riddles of the universe, are answered and solved. And by it, the latent powers inherent in the constitution of men are unfolded and brought into action. Those highly advanced in the science are believed to have obtained such a wonderful degree of power and control over the forces of the universe, that they are as gods compared with the ordinary men. Raja Yoga teaches that not only may power of this kind be secured, but that a wonderful field of knowledge is opened out through its practice. It holds that when the concentrated mind is focused upon thing or subject, the true nature and inner meaning of and concerning that thing or subject will be brought to view. The concentrated mind passes through the object or subject, just as the X-ray passes through a block of wood, and the thing is seen by the eye as it is, in truth, and not as it had appeared before, imperfectly and erroneously. Not only may the outside world be thus explored, but the mental ray may be turned inward, and the secret places of the mind explored. When it is remembered that the bit of mind that each man possesses is like a drop of the ocean which contains within its tiny compass all the elements that make up the ocean, and that to know perfectly the drop is to know perfectly the ocean, then we begin to see what such a power really means. Many in the Western world who have attained great results in the intellectual and scientific fields of endeavor have developed these powers more or less unconsciously. Many great inventors are practical yogis, although they do not realize the source of their power. Anyone who is familiar with the personal mental characteristics of Edison will see that he follows some of the Raja Yoga methods, and that concentration is one of his strongest weapons. And from all reports, Professor Elmer Gates of Washington, D.C., 
whose mind has unfolded many wonderful discoveries and inventions, is also a practical yogi, although he may repudiate the assertion vigorously, and may not have familiarized himself with the principles of the science which he has dropped into unconsciously. Those who have reported upon Professor Gates' methods say that he fairly digs out the inventions and discoveries from his mind, after going into seclusion and practicing concentration in what is known as the mental vision. But we have given you enough of theory for one lesson, and must begin to give you directions, whereby you may aid yourself in developing these latent powers and unfolding these dormant energies. You will notice that in this series we first tell you something about the theory, and then proceed to give you something to do. This is the true yogi method, as followed and practiced by their best teachers. Too much theory is tiresome, and sings the mind to sleep, while too much exercise tires one, and does not give the inquiring part of his mind the necessary food. To combine both in suitable proportions is the better plan, and one that we aim to follow. End of section 8 Chapter 9 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka The Fourth Lesson, Mental Control, Part 2 Mental Drill and Exercises Before we can get the mind to do good work for us, we must first tame it, and bring it to obedience to the will of the eye. The mind, as a rule, has been allowed to run wild, and follow its own sweet will and desires, without regard to anything else. Like a spoiled child or badly trained domestic animal, it gets into much trouble, and is of very little pleasure, comfort, or use. The minds of many of us are like managers of wild animals, each pursuing the bent of its own nature, and going its own way. We have the whole menagerie within us, the tiger, the ape, the peacock, the ass, the goose, the sheep, the hyena, and all the rest. And we have been letting these animals rule us, even our intellect is erratic, unstable, and like the quicksilver to which the ancient occultists compared it, shifting and uncertain. If you will look around you, you will see that those men and women in the world who have really accomplished anything worthwhile have trained their minds to obedience. They have asserted the will over their own minds, and learned mastery and power in that way. The average mind chafes at the restraint of the will, and is like a frisky monkey that will not be taught tricks, but taught it must be if it wants to do good work. And teach it you must, if you expect to get any use from it, if you expect to use it, instead of having it use you. And this is the first thing to be learned in Raja Yoga, this control of the mind. Those who had hoped for some royal road to mastery may be disappointed. But there is only one way, and that is to master and control the mind by the will. Otherwise, it will run away when you most need it. And so we shall give you some exercise designed to aid you in this direction. The first exercise in Raja Yoga is what is called Pratyahara, or the art of making the mind introspective or turned inward upon itself. It is the first step toward mental control. It aims to turn the mind from going outward and gradually turning it inward upon itself or inner nature. The object 
is to gain control of it by the will. The following exercises will aid in that direction. Exercise 1. A. Place yourself in a comfortable position, and so far as possible, free from outside disturbing influences. Make no violent effort to control the mind, but rather allow it to run along for a while and exhaust its efforts. It will take advantage of the opportunity and will jump around like an unchained monkey at first, until it gradually slows down and looks to you for orders. It may take some time to tame down at first trial, but each time you try, it will come around to you in shorter time. The yogis spend much time in acquiring this mental peace and calm, and consider themselves well paid for it. B. When the mind is well calmed down and peaceful, fix the thought on the I am, as taught in our previous lessons. Picture the I as an entity independent of the body, deathless, invulnerable, immortal, real. Then think of it as independent of the body and able to exist without its fleshly covering. Meditate upon this for a time, and then gradually direct the thought to the realization of the I as independent and superior to the mind and controlling same. Go over the general ideas of the first two lessons, and endeavor to calmly reflect upon them and to see them in the mind's eye. You will find that your mind is gradually becoming more and more peaceful and calm, and that the distracting thoughts of the outside world are farther and farther removed from you. C. Then, let the mind pass on to a calm consideration of the third lesson, in which we have spoken of the oneness of all, and the relationship of the I to the one life, power, intelligence, being. You will find that you are acquiring a mental control and calm heretofore unknown to you. The exercises in the first three lessons will have prepared you for this. The following is the most difficult of the variations or degrees of this exercise, but the ability to perform it will come gradually. The exercise consists in gradually shutting out all thought or impression of the outside world, of the body, and of the thoughts themselves, the student concentrating and meditating upon the word and idea, I am, the idea being that he shall concentrate upon the idea of mere being or existence, symbolized by the words I am. Not I am this or I am that or I do this or I think that, but simply I am. This exercise will focus the attention at the very center of being within oneself and will gather in all the mental energies instead of allowing them to be scattered upon outside things. A feeling of peace, strength and power will result for the affirmation and the thought back of it is the most powerful and strongest that one may make for it is a statement of actual being and the turning of the thought inward to that truth. Let the mind first dwell upon the word I, identifying it with the self, and then let it pass on to the word am, which signifies reality and being. Then combine the two with the meanings thereof and the result 
a most powerful focusing of thought inward, and most potent statement of being. It is well to accompany the above exercise with a comfortable and easy physical attitude, so as to prevent the distraction of the attention by the body. In order to do this, one should assume an easy attitude, and then relax every muscle, and take the tension from every nerve, until a perfect sense of ease, comfort, and relaxation is obtained. You should practice this until you have fully acquired it. It will be useful to you in many ways, besides rendering concentration and meditation easier. It will act as a rest cure for tired body, nerves, and mind. Exercise 2 The second step in Raja Yoga is what is known as Tarana, or concentration. This is a most wonderful idea in the direction of focusing the mental forces, and may be cultivated to an almost incredible degree. But all this requires work, time, and patience. But the student will be well repaid for it. Concentration consists in the mind focusing upon a certain subject or object and being held there for a time. This, at first thought, seems very easy, but a little practice will show how difficult it is to firmly fix the attention and hold it there. It will have a tendency to waver and move to some other object or subject, and much practice will be needed in order to hold it at the desired point. But practice will accomplish wonders, as one may see by observing people who have acquired this faculty, and who use it in their everyday life. But the following point should be remembered. Many persons have acquired the faculty of concentrating their attention, but have allowed it to become almost involuntary, and they become a slave to it, forgetting themselves and everything else, and often neglecting necessary affairs. This is the ignorant way of concentrating, and those addicted to it become slaves to their habits instead of masters of their minds. They become daydreamers and absent-minded people instead of masters. They are to be pitied as much as those who cannot concentrate at all. The secret is in a mastery of the mind. The yogis can concentrate at will, and completely bury themselves in the subject before them, and extract from it every item of interest, and can then pass the mind from the thing at will, the same control being used in both cases. They do not allow fits of abstraction or absent-mindedness to come upon them, nor are they daydreamers. On the contrary, they are very wide-awake individuals, close observers, clear thinkers, correct reasoners. They are masters of their minds, not slaves to their moods. The ignorant concentrator buries himself in the object or subject and allows it to master and absorb himself, while the trained yogi thinkers asserts the eye, and then directs his mind to concentrate upon the subject or object, keeping it well under control and in view all the time. Do you see the difference? Then heed the lesson. The following exercises may be found useful in the first steps of concentration. A. Concentrate the attention upon some familiar object, a pencil, for instance. Hold the mind there, and consider the pencil to the exclusion of any other object. Consider its size, color, 
shape, kind of wood. Consider its uses and purposes, its materials, the process of its manufacture, etc., etc., etc. In short, think as many things about the pencil as possible, allowing the mind to pursue any associated bypaths, such as a consideration of the graphite of which the lead is made, the forest from which came the wood used in making the pencil, the history of pencils and other implements used for writing, etc. In short, exhaust the subject of pencils, and considering a subject under concentration, the following plan of synopsis will be found useful. Think of the thing in question from the following viewpoints. 1. The thing itself. 2. The place from whence it came. 3. Its purpose or use. 4. Its associations. 5. Its probable end. Do not let the apparently trivial nature of the inquiry discourage you, for the simplest form of mental training is useful and will help to develop your will and concentration. It is akin to the process of developing a physical muscle by some simple exercise. And in both cases, one loses sight of the unimportance of the exercise itself in view of the end to be gained. b. Concentrate the attention upon some part of the body, the hand, for instance, and fixing your entire attention upon it, shut off or inhibit all sensation from the other parts of the body. A little practice will enable you to do this. In addition to the mental training, this exercise will stimulate the part of the body concentrated upon for reasons that will appear in future lessons. Change the parts of the body concentrated upon and thus give the mind a variety of exercises and the body the effect of a general stimulation. C. These exercises may be extended indefinitely upon familiar objects about you. Remember always that the thing in itself is of no importance, the whole idea being to train the mind to obey the will, so that when you really wish to use the mental forces upon some important object, you may find them well trained and obedient. Do not be tempted to slight this part of the work because it is dry and uninteresting, for it leads up to things that are most interesting and opens a door to a fascinating subject. D. Practice focusing the attention upon some abstract subject, that is, upon some subject of interest that may offer a field for mental exploration. Think about the subject in all its phases and branches, following up one bypath and then another, until you feel that you know all about the subject that your mind has acquired. You will be surprised to find how much more you know about any one thing or subject than you had believed possible. In hidden corners of your mind, you will find some useful or interesting information about the thing in question, and when you are through, you will feel well posted upon it and upon the things connected with it. This exercise will not only help to develop your intellectual powers, but will strengthen your memory and broaden your mind and give you more confidence in yourself. And... In addition, you will have taken a valuable exercise in concentration or tarana. The importance of concentration. Concentration is a focusing of the mind. And this focusing of the mind requires a focusing or bringing to a center 
of the will. The mind is concentrated because the will is focused upon the object. The mind flows into the mold made by the will. The above exercises are designed not only to accustom the mind to the obedience and direction of the will, but also tend to accustom the will to command. We speak of strengthening the will, when what we really mean is training the mind to obey, and accustoming the will to command. Our will is strong enough, but we do not realize it. The will takes root in the very center of our being, in the I, but our imperfectly developed mind does not recognize this fact. We are like young elephants that do not recognize their own strength, but allow themselves to be mastered by puny drivers whom they could brush aside with a movement. The will is back of all action, all doing, mental and physical. We shall have much to say touching the will in these lessons, and the student should give the matter his careful attention. Let him look around him, and he will see that the great difference between the men who have stepped forward from the ranks and those who remain huddled up in the crowd consists in determination and will. As Buxton has well said, the longer I live, the more certain I am that the great difference between men, the feeble and the powerful, the great and the insignificant, is energy and invincible determination. And he might have added that the thing behind that energy and invincible determination was will. The writers and thinkers of all ages have recognized the wonderful and transcendent importance of the will. Tennyson sings, O living will, thou shalt endure when all that seems shall suffer shock. Oliver Wendell Holmes says, The seat of the will seems to vary with the organ through which it is manifested, to transport itself to different parts of the brain, as we may wish to recall a picture, a phrase, a melody, to throw its force on the muscles or the intellectual processes. Like the general-in-chief, its place is everywhere in the field of action. It is the least like an instrument of any of our faculties, the farthest removed from our conceptions of mechanism and matter as we commonly define them. Holmes was correct in his idea, but faulty in his details. The will does not change its seat, which is always in the center of the ego, but the will forces the mind to all parts and in all directions, and it directs the prana, or vital force, likewise. The will is indeed the general-in-chief, but it does not rush to the various points of action, but sends its messengers and couriers there to carry out its orders. Buxton has said, The will will do anything that can be done in this world, and no talents no circumstances, no opportunities will make a two-legged creature a man without it. Ike Marvel truly says, Resolve is what makes a man manifest, not puny resolve, not crude determinations, not errant purpose, but that strong and indefatigable will which treads down difficulties and danger as a boy treads down the heaving frostland of winter, which kindles his eye and brain with a proud pulse-beat toward the unattainable. Will makes men giants. The great obstacle to the proper use of the will, in the case of the majority of people, is the lack of ability to focus the attention. The yogis clearly understand this point. In many of the Raja Yoga exercises, 
which are given to the students by the teachers, are designed to overcome this difficulty. Attention is the outward evidence of the will. As a French writer has said, the attention is subject to the superior authority of the ego. I yield it, or I withhold it, as I please. I direct it, in turn, to several points. I concentrate it upon each point as long as my will can stand the effort. Professor James has said, The essential achievement of the will, when it is most voluntary, is to attend to a difficult object and hold it fast before the mind. Effort of attention is the essential phenomenon of the will. And Professor Halleck says, The first step toward the development of will lies in the exercise of attention. Ideas grow in distinctness and motor power as we attend to them. If we take two ideas of the same intensity and center the attention upon one, we shall notice how much it grows in power. Professor Sully says, Attention may be roughly defined as the active self-direction of the mind to any object which presents itself at the moment. The word attention is derived from two Latin words, ad tendere, meaning to stretch towards, and this is just what the yogis know it to be. By means of their psychic or clairvoyant sight, they see the thought of the attentive person stretched out toward the object attended to, like a sharp wedge, the point of which is focused upon the object under consideration, the entire force of the thought being concentrated at that point. This is true not only when the person is considering an object, but when he is earnestly impressing his ideas upon another, or upon some task to be accomplished. Attention means reaching the mind out to and focusing it upon something. The trained will exhibits itself in a tenacious attention, and this attention is one of the signs of the trained will. The student must not hastily conclude that this kind of attention is a common faculty among men. On the contrary, it is quite rare, and is seen only among those of strong mentality. Anyone may fasten his attention upon some passing, pleasing thing, but it takes a trained will to fasten it upon some unattractive thing, and hold it there. Of course, the trained occultist is able to throw interest into the most unattractive thing upon which it becomes advisable to focus his attention, but this, in itself, comes with the trained will and is not the possession of the average man. Voluntary attention is rare, and is found only among strong characters. But it may be cultivated and grown, until he who has scarcely a shade of it today, in time may become a giant. It is all a matter of practice, exercise, and will. It is difficult to say too much, in favor of the development of the faculty of tenacious attention. One possessing this developed faculty is able to accomplish far more than even a much brighter man who lacks it. And the best way to train the attention under the direction of the will is to practice upon uninteresting objects and ideas, holding them before the mind until they begin to assume an interest. This is difficult at first, but the task soon begins to take on a pleasant aspect, for one finds that his will-power and attention are growing, and he feels himself acquiring a force and power that were lacking before. He realizes that he is growing stronger. Charles Dickens said that the secret of his success 
consisted in his developing a faculty of throwing his entire attention into whatever he happened to be doing at the moment, and then being able to turn that same degree of attention to the next thing coming before him for consideration. He was like a man behind a great searchlight, which was successively turned upon point after point, illuminating each in turn. The eye is the man behind the light, and the will is the reflector, the light being the attention. This discussion of will and attention may seem somewhat dry to the student, but that is all the more reason that he should attend to it. It is the secret that lies at the basis of the science of Raja Yoga, and the yogi masters have attained a degree of concentration, will, and attention that would be inconceivable to the average man on the street. By reason of this, they are able to direct the mind here and there, outward or inward, with an enormous force. They are able to focus the mind upon a small thing with remarkable intensity, just as the rays of the sun may be focused through a sunglass and caused to ignite linen, or, on the other hand, they are able to send forth the mind with intense energy, illuminating whatever it rests upon, just as happens in the case of the strong electric searchlight with which many of us are familiar. By all means, start in to cultivate the attention and will. Practice on the unpleasant tasks. Do the things that you have before you and from which you have been shrinking because they were unpleasant. Throw interest into them, and the difficulty will vanish, and you will come out of it much stronger and filled with a new sense of power. Mentrim Affirmation I have a will. It is my inalienable property and right. I determine to cultivate and develop it by practice and exercise. My mind is obedient to my will. I assert my will over my mind. I am master of my mind and body. I assert my mastery. My will is dynamic, full of force and energy and power. I feel my strength. I am strong. I am forceful. I am vital. I am center of consciousness, energy, strength, and power, and I claim my birthright. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga Recording by Siddharth A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka Chapter 10 The fifth lesson, the cultivation of attention, part one. In our last lesson, we called your attention to the fact that the yogis devote considerable time and practice to the acquirement of concentration. And we also had something to say regarding the relation of attention to the subject of concentration. In this relation, we shall have more to say on the subject of attention. The important things relating to the practice of Raja Yoga and the yogis insist upon their students practicing systematically to develop and cultivate the faculty. Attention lies at the base of Vilpa and the cultivation of one makes easy the exercise of the other. To explain why we lay so much importance to the cultivation of attention would necessitate our anticipating future lessons of the series which we do not deem advisable at this time, and so we must ask our students to take our word for it, that all that we have to say regarding the importance of the cultivation of attention is occasioned by the relation of that subject to the use of the mind in certain directions, as will appear fully later on. In order to let you know that we are not advancing some peculiar theory of the yogis, which may not be in harmony with modern Western science, 
we give you in this article a number of quotations from Western writers and thinkers touching upon this important faculty of the mind so that you may see that the West and the East agree upon this main point. However different may be their explanations of the fact or their use of the power gained by the cultivation of attention, as we said in our last lesson, the word attention is derived from two Latin words, ad tendendre, meaning to stretch the word, which is really what attention is. The eye wills that the mind be focused on some particular object or thing, and the mind obeys and stretches the word, that object or thing, focusing its entire energy upon it observing every detail, dissecting, analyzing consciously and subconsciously, drawing to itself every possible bit of information regarding it, both from within and from without. We cannot lay too much stress upon the acquirement of this great faculty, or rather the development of it, for it is necessary for the intelligent study of Raja Yoga. In order to bring out the importance of the subject, Suppose we start in by actually giving our attention to the subject of attention and see how much more there is in it than we had thought. We shall be well repaid for the amount of time and trouble extended upon it. Attention has been defined as a focusing of consciousness or if one prefers the form of expression as detention in consciousness. In the first case, we may liken it to the action of the sun class through which sun's rays are concentrated upon an object, the result being that heat is gathered together at a small given point, the intensity of the same being raised many degrees until heat is sufficient to burn a piece of wood or evaporate water. If the rays were not focused, the same rays and heat would have been scattered over a large surface and the effect and power lessened. So it is with the mind. If it is allowed to scatter itself over the entire field of a subject, it will exert but little power and the results will be weak. But if it is passed through the sun class of tension and focused first over one part and then over the other and so on, the matter may be mastered in detail and the result accomplished that will seem little less than marvelous to those who do not know the secret. Thompson has said, the experiences most permanently impressed upon consciousness are those upon which the greatest amount of attention has been fixed. Another writer upon the subject has said that attention is so essentially necessary to understanding that without some degree of the ideas and perceptions that pass through the mind seem to have no trace behind them. Hamilton has said, an act of attention that is, an act of concentration, seems thus necessary to every exertion of consciousness, as a certain contraction of the pupil is requisite to every exertion of vision. Attention then is consciousness, what the contraction of the pupil is to sight, or to the eye of the mind, what the microscope or telescope is to the bodily eye. It constitutes the better half of all intellectual power, and broad eye adds quite forcibly it is attention much more than any difference in the abstract power of reasoning which constitutes the vast difference which exists between minds of different individuals. And Butler gives us this important testimony. The most important intellectual habit I know of is the habit of attending exclusively to the matter in hand. It is commonly said that genius cannot be infused by education, yet this power of concentrated attention which belongs as a part of his gift to every great discoverer, is unquestionably capable of almost indefinite augmentation by resolute practice. And concluding this review of opinions and endorsements of that which the yogis have so much to say and to which they attach so much importance, let us listen to the words of B.T. who says, the force wherewith anything strikes the mind is generally in proportion to the degree of attention bestowed upon it. Moreover, the great art of memory is attention, and inattentive people always have bad memories. There are two general kinds of attention. The first is the attention directed within the mind upon mental objects and concepts. The other is the attention directed outward upon objects external to ourselves. The same general rules 
and laws apply to both equally. Likewise, there may be drawn another distinction and division of attention into two classes, attention attracted by some impression coming into consciousness without any conscious effort of the will. This is called involuntary attention, for the attention and interest is caught by the attractiveness or novelty of the subject. Attention directed to some object by an effort of the will is called voluntary attention. Involuntary attention is quite common and requires no special training. In fact, the lower animals and younger children seem to have a greater share of it than the adult men. A great percentage of men and women never get beyond the stage to any marked degree. On the other hand, voluntary attention requires effort, will, and determination, and a certain mental training that is beyond the majority of people. For they will not take the trouble to direct their attention in this way. Voluntary attention is the mark of the student and other thoughtful men. They focus their minds on objects that do not yield immediate interest or pleasure in order that they may learn and accomplish. The careless person will not thus fasten his attention at least not more than a moment or so for his involuntary attention is soon attracted by some passing object of no matter how trifling a nature and the voluntary attention disappears and is forgotten. Voluntary attention is developed by practice and perseverance and is well worth the trouble for nothing in the mental world is accomplished without its use. The attention does not readily fasten itself to uninteresting objects and unless interest can be created it, it requires a considerable degree of voluntary attention in order that mind may be fastened upon such an object and more than this even if the ordinary attention is attracted it will soon waver unless there is some interesting change in the aspect of the object that will give the attention a fresh hold of interest, or unless some new quality, characteristic or property manifests itself in the object. This fact occurs because the mind mechanism has not been trained to bear prolonged voluntary attention, and, in fact, the physical brain is not accustomed to the task, although it may be so trained, by patient practice. It has long been noticed by investigators that the attention may be rested and freshened either by withdrawing the voluntary attention from the object and allowing the attention to manifest along involuntary lines toward passing objects, etc. Or, on the other hand, by directing the voluntary attention into a new field of observation towards some new object. Sometimes one plan will seem to give the best results and again the other will seem preferable we have called your attention to the fact that interest develops attention and holds it fixed while an uninteresting object or subject requires a much greater effort and application this fact is apparent to anyone a common illustration may be found in the matter of reading a book nearly everyone will give his undivided attention to some bright thrilling story but few are able to use sufficient voluntary attention to master the pages of some scientific work but right here, we wish to call your attention to the other side of the case, which is another example of the fact that truth is composed of paradoxes. Just as interest develops attention, so it is a truth that attention develops interest. If one will take the trouble to give a little voluntary attention to an object, he will soon find that a little perseverance will bring to light points of interest in the object. Things before unseen and unsuspected are quite are quickly brought to light, and many new faces and aspects of the subject or object are seen, each one of which in turn becomes an object of interest. This is a fact not so generally known, and one that it will be well for you to remember and to use in practice. Look for the interesting features of an uninteresting thing, and they will appear to your view, and before long the uninteresting object will have changed into a thing having many-sided interests. Voluntary attention is one of the signs of a developed will, that is, of a mind that has been well trained by the will, for the will is always strong, and it is the mind that has to be trained, not the will. On the other hand, one of the best ways to train the mind by the will is by practice in voluntary attention. So you see how the rule works both ways. Some Western psychologists 
have even advanced theories that voluntary attention is the only part of the will that part is sufficient for if the attention be firmly fixed and held upon an object the mind will do the rest we do not agree with this school of philosophers but merely mention the fact as an illustration of the importance attributed by psychologists to this matter of voluntary attention a man of a strongly developed attention often accomplishes far more than some much brighter man who lacks it voluntary attention and application is a very good substitute for genius and often accomplishes far more in the long run voluntary attention is the fixing of the mind earnestly and intently upon some particular object at the same time shutting off from consciousness other objects pressing for entrance hamilton has defined it as consciousness voluntarily applied under its law of limitations to some determinate object the same writer goes on to state that the greater the number of objects to which our consciousness is simultaneously extended the smaller is the intensity with which it is able to consider each and consequently the less vivid and distinct will be the information it contains of the several objects when our interest in any particular object is excited and when we wish to obtain all the knowledge concerning it in our power it behooves us to limit our concentration to that object to the exclusion of others end of chapter 10 chapter 11 of a series of lessons in raja yoga recording was atharth a series of lessons in raja yoga by yogi ramacharaka chapter 11 the human mind has the power of attending to only one object at a time although it is able to pass from one object to another with marvelous degree of speed so rapidly in fact that some have held that it could grasp several things at once but the best authorities eastern and western hold the single idea theory as being correct on this point we may quote a few authorities jo freud says that it is established by experience that we cannot give our attention to two different objects at the same time and holland states that two thoughts however closely related to one another cannot be presumed to exist at the same time and lewis has told us that the nature of our organism prevents our having more than one aspect of an object at each instant presented to the consciousness watley says the best philosophers are agreed that the mind cannot actually attend to more than one thing at a time but when it appears to be doing so it is really shifting with prodigious rapidity backward and forward from one to the other by giving a concentrated voluntary attention to an object we are not only we not only are able to see and think about it with the greatest possible degree of clearness but the mind has a tendency under such circumstances to bring into the field of consciousness all different ideas associated in our memory with that object or subject and to build around the object or subject a mass of associated facts and information and at the same time the attention given the subject makes more vivid and clear all that we learn about the thing at the time and in fact all that we may afterwards learn about it it seems to cut a channel through which knowledge flows attention magnifies and increases the powers of perception and greatly aids the exercise of the perceptive faculties by paying attention to something seen or heard one is enabled to observe the details of the thing seen or heard and where the inattentive mind acquires say three impressions the attentive mind absorbs three times three or perhaps three times three times three or 27 and as we have just said attention brings into play the powers of association and gives us the loose end of an almost infinite chain of associated facts stored away in our memory forming new combinations of facts which we have never grouped together before and bring out into the field of consciousness all the many scraps of information regarding the thing to which we are giving attention the proof of this is within the experience of everyone whereas the one who does not remember sitting down to some writing painting reading etc with interest and attention in finding much to surprise what a flow of facts regarding the matter in hand was passing through his mind attention seems to focus all the knowledge of a thing that you possess 
and by bringing it to a point enables you to combine, associate, classify, etc. and thus create new knowledge. Gibbon tells us that after he gave a brief glance and consideration to a new subject, he suspended further work upon it and allowed his mind, under concentrated attention, to bring forth all his associated knowledge regarding the subject, after which he renewed the task with increased power and efficiency. The more one's attention is fixed upon a subject under consideration, the deeper is the impression which the subject leaves upon the mind, and the easier will it be for him to afterwards pursue the same train of thought and work. Attention is a prerequisite of good memory, and in fact there can be no memory at all unless some degree of attention is given. The degree of memory depends upon the degree of attention and interest, and when it is considered that the work of today is made efficient by the memory of things learned yesterday, the day before yesterday, and so on, it is seen that the degree of attention given today regulates the quality of the work of tomorrow. Some authorities have described genius as the result of great powers of attention, or, at least, that the two seem to run together. Some writer has said that possibly the best definition of genius is the power of concentrating upon some one subject until its possibilities are exhausted and absorbed. Simpson has said that the power and habit of thinking closely and continuously upon the subject at hand to the exclusion for the time of all other subjects is one of the principal, if indeed not the principal means of success. Sir Isaac Newton has told his plan of absorbing information and knowledge. He has stated that he would keep the subject under consideration before him continually and then would wait till the first dawning of perception gradually brightened into a clear light, little by little, a mental sunrise, in fact. That sage observer, Dr. Abercrombie, has written that he considered that he knew of no more important rule for rising to eminence in any profession or occupation than the ability to do one thing at a time, avoiding all distracting and diverting objects or subjects, and keeping the leading matter continually before the mind. And others have added that such a course will enable one to observe relations between the subject and other things that will not be apparent to the careless observer or student. The degree of attention cultivated by a man is the degree of his capacity for intellectual work, as we have said. The great men of all walks of life have developed this faculty to a wonderful degree, and many of them seem to get results intuitively, whereas in truth they obtain by reason of their concentrated power of attention which enables them to see right into the center of the subject or proposition, and all around it, back and front and all sides, in a space of time incredible to the man who has not cultivated this mighty power. Men who have devoted much attention to some special line of work or research are able to act almost as if they possessed second sight. Providing the subject is within their favorite field of endeavor, attention quickens every one of the faculties, the reasoning faculties, the senses, the deriding qualities, the analytical faculties, and so on, each being given a fine edge by their use under concentrated attention. And on the other hand, there is no surer indication of a weak mind than the deficiency in attention. This weakness may arise from the illness or physical weakness reacting upon the brain, in which case the trouble is but temporary, or it may arise from the lack of mental development. Imbeciles and idiots have little or no attention. The great French psychologist, Lois, speaking of this fact, says, Imbeciles and idiots see badly, hear badly, feel badly, and their sensorium is, in consequence, in a similar condition of sensitive poverty. Its impressionability for the things of external world is at a minimum, its sensibility weak, and consequently, it is difficult to provoke the physiological condition necessary for the absorption of the external impression. In old age, the attention is the first faculty to show signs of decay. Some authorities have held that the memory was the first faculty to be affected by the approach of old age, but this is incorrect, for it is a matter of common experience that the aged manifest a wonderfully clear memory of events occurring in the far past. 
the reason that their memory of recent events is so poor is because of their failing powers of attention has prevented them from receiving strong clear mental impressions and as is the impression so is the memory their early impressions having been clear and strong are easily recalled while the later ones being weak are recalled with difficulty if the memory were at fault it would be difficult for them to recall any impression recent or far distant in time but we must stop quoting examples and authorities and urging upon you the importance of the faculty of attention if you do not realize it it is because you have not given the subject the attention that you should have exercised and further repetition would not remedy matters admitting the importance of attention from the psychological point of view not to speak of the occult side of the subject is it not a matter of importance for you to start in to cultivate that faculty we think so and the only way to cultivate any mental or physical part or faculty is to exercise it exercise uses up a muscle or mental faculty but the organism makes haste to rush to the scene additional material cell stuff nerve force etc to repair the waste and it always sends a little more than is needed and this little more continually accruing and increasing is what increases the muscle and brain centers and improved and strengthened brain centers give the mind better instruments with which to work one of the first things to do in the cultivation of attention is to learn to think of and do one thing at a time acquiring the knack or habit of attending closely to the things before us and then passing on to the next and treating it in the same way is most conducive to success and its practice is the best exercise for the cultivation of the faculty of attention and on the contrary there is nothing more harmful from the point of view of successful performance and nothing that will do more to destroy the power of giving attention than the habit of trying to do one thing while thinking of another the thinking part of the mind and the acting part should work together not in a position dr beatty speaking of the subject tells us it is a matter of no small importance that we acquire the habit of doing only one thing at a time by which i mean that while attending to any one object our thoughts ought not to wander to another and granville adds a frequent cause of failure in the faculty of attention is striving to think of more than one thing at a time in k courts approving a writer who says she did things easily because she attended to do them in the doing when she made bread she thought of the bread and not of the fashion of her next dress or of her partner at the last dance lord chesterfield said there is time enough for everything in the course of the day if you do but one thing at a time but there is not enough in the year if you try to do two things at a time to attain the best results one should practice concentrating upon the task before him shutting out so far as possible every other idea or thought one should even forget self personality in such cases as there is nothing more destructive of good thinking than to allow morbid self-consciousness to intrude one does best when he forgets himself in his work and sinks his personality in the creative work the earnest man or woman is the one who sinks personality in the desired result or performance of the task undertaken the actor or preacher or orator or writer must lose sight of himself to get the best results keep the attention fixed on on the thing before you and let the self take care of itself in connection with the above we may relate an anecdote of vatley that may be interesting in connection with the consideration of the subject of losing one's self in the task he was asked for a recipe for bashfulness and replied that the person was bashful simply because he was thinking of himself and the impression he was making his recipe was that the young man should think of others of the pleasure he could give them and in that way he would forget all about himself the prescription is said to have effected the cure the same authority has written let both the extemporary speaker and the reader of his own compositions study to avoid as far as possible all thoughts of self earnestly fixing the mind on the matter of what is delivered and they will feel less that embarrassment which arises from the thought 
of what opinion the hearers will form of them. The same writer, Ratley, seems to have made quite a study of attention and has given us some interesting information on its details. The following may be read with interest, and if properly understood, may be employed to advantage, he says. It is a fact, and a very curious one, that many people find they can best attend to any serious matter when they are occupied with something else, which requires a little, but a little, attention, such as working with the needle, cutting open paper leaves, or, for want of some such employment, fiddling anyhow with fingers. He does not give the reason for this, and at first sight it might seem like a contradiction of the one thing at a time idea, but a closer examination will show us that the minor work, the cutting leaves, etc., is in the nature of any involuntary or automatic movement, inasmuch as it requires little or no voluntary action, and seems to do itself. It does not take off the attention from the main subject, but perhaps acts to catch the vast attention that often tries to divide the attention from some voluntary act to another. The habit mind may be doing one thing while the attention is fixed on another. For instance, one may be writing with his attention firmly fixed upon the thought he wishes to express, while at the time his hand is doing the writing, apparently with no attention being given but let a boy or person unaccustomed to writing try to express his thoughts in this way, and you will find that he is hampered in the flow of his thoughts by the fact that he has to give much attention to the mechanical act of writing. In the same way, the beginner on the typewriter finds it difficult to compose to the machine, while the experienced typist finds mechanical movements no hindrance whatever to the flow of the thought and focusing of attention. In fact, many find that they can compose much better while using the typewriter than they can by dictating to a stenographer. We think you will see the principle. And now for a little mental drill and tension, that you may be started on the road to cultivate this important faculty. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ramacharaka Chapter 12 Mental Drill and Attention Exercise 1 Begin by taking some familiar object and placing it before you. Try to get as many impressions regarding it as possible for you. Study its shape, its color, its size, and the thousand and one little peculiarities about it that present themselves to your attention. In doing this, reduce the thing to its simplest parts, analyze it as far as is possible, dissect it mentally and study its parts in detail. The more simple and small the part to be considered, the more clearly will the impression be received, and the more vividly will it be recalled. Reduce the thing to the smallest possible proportions and then examine each portion in mastering that, then pass on to the next part, and so on until you will have covered the entire field. Then when you have exhausted the object, take a pencil and paper and put down as nearly as possible all the things or details of the object examined. When you have done this, compare the written description with the object itself and see how many things you have failed to note. The next day, take up the same object and after re-examining it, write down the details and you will find that you have stored away a greater number of impressions regarding it, and moreover, you will have discovered many new details during your second examination. This exercise strengthens the memory as well as the attention, for the two closely connected, the memory depending largely upon the clearness and the strength of impressions received, while the impressions depend upon the amount of attention given to the thing observed. Do not tie yourself with this exercise, for a tired attention is poor attention. Better try it by degrees, increasing the task a little each time you try it. Make a game of it if you like, and you will find it quite interesting to notice the steady but gradual improvement. And it will be interesting to practice this in connection with some friend, wearing the exercise by both examining the object and writing down the impressions separately and then comparing results. This adds interest to the task, and you will be surprised to see how rapidly both of you increase 
in your powers of observation, which powers, of course, result from attention. Exercise 2. This exercise is but a variation of the first one. It consists in entering a room and taking a hasty glance around and then walking out and afterward writing down the number of things that you have observed with a description of each. You will be surprised to observe how many things you have missed at the first sight and how you will improve in observation by a little practice. This exercise also may be improved by the assistance of a friend as related in our last exercise. It is astonishing how many details one may observe and remember after a little practice. It is related of Howden, the French conjurer, that he improved and developed his faculty of attention and memory by playing this game with a young relative. They would pass by a shop window, taking a hasty attentive glance at its contents. Then they would go around the corner and compare notes. At first they could remember only a few prominent articles, that is, their attention could grasp only a few, but as they developed by practice they found that they could observe and remember vast number of things and objects in the window, and at last it is related that Howden could pass rapidly before any large shop window, bestowing upon it one hasty glance, and then tell names of and closely describe nearly every object in plain sight in the window. The feat was accomplished by the fact that the cultivated attention enabled Howden to fasten upon his mind a vivid mental image of the window and its contents, and then he was able to describe the articles one by one from the picture in his mind. Howden taught his son to develop attention by a simple exercise which may be interesting and of value to you. He would lay down a domino before the boy, a uh, five-four, for example. He would require the boy to tell him the combined number at once, without allowing him to stop to count the spots one by one. Nine, the boy would answer after a moment's hesitation. Then another domino, three-four, would be added. That makes sixteen, cried the boy. Two dominoes at a time was the second day's task. The next day, three, was the standard. The next day, four, and so on, until the boy was able to handle twelve dominoes. That is to say, give instantaneously the total number of spots on twelve dominoes at a single glance. This was attention in earnest, and shows what practice will do to develop a faculty. The result was shown by the wonderful powers of observation, memory, and attention. Together with instantaneous mental action that the boy developed, not only was he able to add dominoes instantaneously, but he had powers of observation that seemed little short of miraculous, and yet it is related that he had poor attention and deficient memory to begin with. If this seems incredible, let us remember how old whist players note and remember every card in the pack, and can tell whether they have been played or not, and all the circumstances attending upon them. The same is true of chess players who observe every move and can relate the whole game in detail long after it had been played. And remember also how one woman may pass another woman on the street and without seeming to give her more than a careless glance may be able to do relate in detail every feature of the other woman's apparel, including its color, texture, style of fashioning, probable price of the material, etc., etc. And a mere man would have noticed scarcely anything about it, because he would not have given it any attention. But how soon would that man learn to equal his sister in attention and observation of woman's wearing apparel, if his business success depended on it, or if his speculative instinct was called on to play by a wager with some friend as to who could remember the most about a woman's clothing seen in a passing glance. You see, it is all a matter of interest and attention, but we forget that attention may be developed and cultivated, and we complain that we cannot remember things, or that we do not seem to be able to take notice. A little practice will do wonders in this direction. Now while the above exercises will develop your memory and powers of observation, still that is not the main reason that we have given them to you. We have an ulterior object that will appear in time. We aim to develop your willpower, and we know that attention stands at the gate of willpower. In order to be able to use your will, you must be able to focus the attention forcibly and distinctly. 
and these childish exercises will help you to develop the mental muscles of the attention. If you could but realize the childish games the young yogi students are required to play in order to develop mental faculties, you would change your mind about the yogi Arabs whom you have been thinking about as mere dreamers, far removed from the practical. These men and their students are intensely practical. They have gained the mastery of the mind and its faculties and are able to use them as sharp-edged tools, while the untrained man finds that he has but a dull, unsharpened blade that will do nothing but hack and hew roughly instead of being able to produce the finished product. The yogi believes in giving the eye good tools with which to work, and he spends much time in tempering and sharpening these tools. Oh, no, the yogi are not idle dreamers. Their grasp of practical things would surprise many a practical, matter-of-fact, Western businessman, if he could observe it. And so, we ask you to practice observing things. The two exercises we have given are but indications of the general line. We could give thousands, but you can prepare them yourselves, as well as could we. The little Hindu boy is taught attention by being asked to note and remember the number, color, character, and other details of a number of colored stones, jewelry, etc., shown for an instant in an open palm, the hand being closed the moment after. He is taught to note and describe passing travelers and their equipages, houses he sees on his journeys, and thousands of other everyday objects. The results are almost marvelous. In this way he is prepared as a jailer or a student, and he brings to his guru, a teacher, a brain well developed, a mind thoroughly trained to obey the will of the eye, with the faculties quickened to perceive instantly that which others would fail to see in a fortnight. It is true that he does not turn these faculties to business or other so-called practical pursuits, but prefers to devote them to abstract studies and pursuits outside of that which the Western man considers to be the end and aim of life. But remember that the two civilizations are quite different, following different ideals, having different economic conditions, living in different worlds, as it were. But that is all a matter of taste and ideals. The faculty for the practical life of the West is possessed by the chela, if he saw fit to use it. But all Hindu youths are not chelas. Remember, nor are all Western youths captains of industry or Edison's. Mantram Affirmation I am using my attention to develop my mental faculties so as to give the eye a perfect instrument with which to work. The mind is my instrument and I am bringing it to a state of capacity for perfect work. Mantram or Affirmation There is but one life, one life underlying. This life is manifest through me, and through every other shape, form, and thing. I am resting on the bosom of the great ocean of life, and it is supporting me, and will carry me safely. Though the waves rise and fall, though the storms rage and the tempests roar, I am safe on the ocean of life, and rejoice as I feel the sway of its motion. Nothing can harm me, though changes may come and go, I am safe. I am one with all life, and its power, knowledge, and peace are behind, underneath, and within me. O oh, one life, express thyself through me. Carry me now on the crest of the wave, now deep down in the trough of the ocean, supported always by thee. All is good to me, as I feel thy life moving in and through me. I am alive through thy life, and I open myself to thy full manifestation and inflow. End of chapter 12 Chapter 6 of a series of lessons in Raja Yoga This is a LibriVox recording. A series of lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Ram Charaka Chapter 13 The Sixth Lesson Cultivation of Perception Man gains his knowledge of the outside world through his senses, 
and consequently many of us are in the habit of thinking of these senses as if they did the sensing instead of being merely carriers of the vibrations coming from the outside world which are then presented to the mind for examination we shall speak of this at greater length a little later on in this lesson just now we wish to impress upon you the fact that it is the mind that perceives not the senses and consequently a development of perception is really a development of the mind the yogis put their students through a very arduous course of practice and exercises designed to develop their powers of perception to many this would appear to be merely a development of the senses which might appear odd in view of the fact that the yogis are constantly preaching the folly of being governed and ruled by the senses but there is nothing paradoxical about all this for the yogis while preaching the folly of sense life and manifesting the teaching in their lives nevertheless believe in any and all exercises calculated to sharpen the mind and develop it to a keen state and condition they see a great difference between having a sharpened perception on one hand and being a slave to the senses on the other for instance what would be thought of a man who objected to acquiring a keen eyesight for fear it would lead him away from higher things by reason of his becoming attached to the beautiful things he might see to realize the folly of this idea one may look at its logical conclusion which would be that one would be much better off if all their senses were destroyed the absurdity not to say wickedness of such an idea will be apparent to everyone after a minute's consideration the secret of the yogi theory and teachings regarding the development of the mental powers lies in the word mastery the yoga student accomplishes and attains this mastery in two ways the first way is by subordinating all the feelings sense impressions etc to the mastery of the i or will the mastery being obtained in this way by the assertion of the dominancy of the eye over the faculties and emotions etc the second step or way lies in the yogi once having asserted the mastery beginning to develop and perfect the mental instrument so as to get better work and returns from it in this way he increases his kingdom and is master over a much larger territory in order for one to gain knowledge it is necessary to use the best advantage the mental instruments and tools that he finds at his disposal and again one must develop and improve such tools put a keen edge upon them etc not only does one gain a great benefit from a development of the faculties of perception but he also acquires an additional benefit from the training of the whole mind arising from the mental discipline and training resulting from the former exercises etc in our previous lessons we have pointed out some of the means by which these faculties might be greatly improved and their efficiency increased in this lesson we shall point out certain directions in which the perceptive faculties may be trained we trust that the simplicity of the idea may not cause any of our students to lose interest in the work if they only knew just what such development would lead to they would gladly follow our suggestions in the matter every one of the ideas and the exercises given by us are intended to lead up to the strengthening of the mind and the attainment of powers and the unfoldment of faculties there is no royal road to raja yoga but the student will be well repaid for the work of climbing the hill of attainment in the view of the above let us examine the question of the senses through the doors of the senses man receives all his information regarding the outside world if he keeps these doors but half open or crowded up with obstacles and rubbish he may expect to receive but few messages from outside but if he keeps his doorways clear and clean he will obtain the best that is passing his way if one were born without sense organs no matter how good a mind he might have he would be compelled to live his life in a dreamy plant life stage of existence with little or no consciousness the mind would be like a seed in the earth that for some reason was prevented from growing one may object that the highest ideas do not come to us through the senses but the reply is that the things obtained through the senses are the raw material upon which the mind works and the fashions the beautiful things that it is able to produce in its highest stages 
just as is the body dependent for growth upon the nourishment taken into it so is the mind dependent for the growth upon the impressions received from the universe and these impressions come largely through the senses it may be objected to that we know many things that we have not received through our senses but does the objector include the impressions that came through his senses in some previous existence and which have been impressed upon his instinctive mind or soul memory it is true that there are higher senses than those usually recognized but nature insists upon one learning the lessons of the lower grade before attempting to those of the higher do not forget that all that we know we have worked for there is nothing that comes to the idler or shirker what we know is merely the result of stored up accumulations of previous experience as lewis has so well said so it will be seen that the yogi idea that one should develop all parts of the mind is strictly correct if one will take the trouble to examine into the matter a man sees and knows but very little of what is going on about him his limitations are great his powers of vision report only a few vibrations of light while below and above the scale lie an infinity of vibrations unknown to him the same is true of the powers of hearing for only a comparatively small portion of the sound waves reach the mind of a man even some of the animals hear more than he does if a man had only one sense he would obtain but a one sense idea of the outside world if another sense is added to his knowledge is doubled and so on the best proof of the relation between increased sense perception and development is had in the study of the evolution of animal forms in the early stages of life the organism has only the sense of feeling and very dim at that and a faint sense of taste then developed smell hearing and sight each marking a distinct advance in the scale of life for a new world has been opened out to the advancing forms of life and when man develops new senses and this is before the race he will be a much wiser and a greater being carpenter many years ago voiced a thought that will be familiar to those who are acquainted with the yogi teachings regarding the unfoldment of new senses he said it does not seem at all improbable that there are properties of matter of which none of our senses can take immediate cognitions and which other beings might be formed to perceive in the same manner as we are sensible to light sound etc and isaac taylor said it may be that within the field observed by the visible and ponderable universe there is existing and moving another element fraught with another species of life corporal indeed and various in its orders but not open to cognitions of those who are confined to the conditions of animal organization is it to be thought that the eye of man is the measure of the creator's power and that he created nothing but that which he has exposed to our present senses the contrary seems much more than barely possible ought we not to think it almost certain another writer professor masson has said if a new sense or two were added to the present normal number in man that which is now the phenomenal world for all of us might for all that we know burst into something amazingly different and wider in consequence of the additional revelations of these new senses but not only is this true but man may increase his powers of knowledge and experience if he will but develop the senses he has to a higher degree of efficiency instead of allowing them to remain comparatively atrophied and toward this end this lesson is written the mind obtains its impressions of objects of the outside world by means of the brain and sense organs the sensory organs are the instruments of the mind as is also the brain and the entire nervous system by means of the nerves and the brain the mind makes use of the sensory organs in order that it may obtain information regarding external objects the senses are usually said to consist of five different forms viz sight hearing smell touch and taste 
the yogis teach that there are higher senses undeveloped or comparatively so in the majority of the race but toward the unfoldment of which the race is tending but we shall not touch upon these latent senses in this lesson, as they belong to another phase of the subject. In addition to the five senses above enumerated, some physiologists and psychologists have held that there are several others in evidence. For instance, the sense by which the inner organs reveal their presence and condition. The muscular system reports to the mind through some sense that is not that of touch, although closely allied to it and the feelings of hunger, thirst, etc. seem to come to us through an unnamed sense. Bernstein has distinguished between the five senses and the one just referred to as follows. The characteristic distinction between these common sensations and the sensations of the senses is that by the latter we gain knowledge of the occurrences and objects which belong to the external world and which sensations we refer to external objects, while by the former we only feel conditions of our own body. A sensation is the internal, mental conception resulting from an external object or fact exciting the sense organs and nerves, and the brain, thus making the mind aware of the external object or fact. As Bain has said, it is the mental impression, feeling, or conscious state resulting from the action of external things on some part of the body, called on that account sensitive. Each channel of sense impressions has an organ or organs peculiarly adapted for the excitation of its substance by the particular kind of vibrations through which it receives impressions. The eye is most cunningly and carefully designed to receive the light waves, and the sound waves produce no effect upon it. And, likewise, the delicate mechanism of the ear responds only to sound waves, light waves failing to register upon it. Each set of sensations is entirely different, and the organs and the nerves designed to register each particular set are peculiarly adapted to their own special work. The organs of sense, including their special nervous systems, may be compared to a delicate instrument that the mind has fashioned for itself, that it may investigate, examine, and obtain reports from the outside world. We have become so accustomed to the workings of the senses that we take them as a matter of course, and fail to recognize them as the delicate and wonderful instruments that they are, designed and perfected by the mind for its own use. If we will think of the soul as designing, manufacturing, and using these instruments, we may begin to understand their true relations to our lives, and accordingly treat them with more respect and consideration. We are in the habit of thinking that we are aware of all the sensations received by our mind. But this is very far from being correct. The unconscious regions of the mind are incomparably larger than the small conscious area that we generally think of when we say, my mind. In future lessons we shall proceed to consider this wonderful area and examine what is to be found there. Tyen has well said, There is going on within us a subterranean process of infinite extent. Its products alone are known to us and are only known to us in the mass. As to elements and their elements, consciousness does not attain to them. They are to sensations what secondary molecules and primary molecules are to bodies. We get a glance here and there at obscure and infinite worlds extending beneath our distinct sensations. These are compounds and wholes. For their elements to be perceptible to consciousness, it is necessary for them to be added together and so to acquire a certain bulk and to occupy a certain time. For if the group does not attain this bulk and does not last this time, we observe no changes in our state. Nevertheless, though it escapes us, there is one. But we must postpone our consideration of this more than interesting phase of the subject until some future lesson when we shall take a trip into the regions of mind under and above consciousness and a most wonderful trip many of us will find it too for the present we must pay our attention to the channels by which the material for knowledge and thought enter our minds 
for these sense impressions come to us from without are indeed material upon which the mind works in order to manufacture the product called thought this material we obtain through the channels of the senses and then store in that wonderful storehouse the memory from whence we bring out material from time to time which we proceed to weave into the fabric of thought the skill of the worker depends upon his training and his ability to select and combine the proper materials and the acquiring of the good materials to be stored up is an important part of the work a mind without stored up material of impressions and experiences would be like a factory without material the machinery would have nothing upon which to work and the shop would be idle as helmholtz has said apprehension by the senses supplies directly or indirectly the material of all human knowledge or at least the stimulus necessary to develop every inborn faculty of the mind and herbert spencer has this to say of this phase of the subject it is almost a truism to say that in proportion to the numerousness of the objects that can be distinguished and in proportion to the variety of coexistences and sequences that can be severally responded to must be the number and rapidity and the variety of the changes within the organism must be the amount of vitality a little reflection upon this subject will show us that the greater degree of exercise and training given the senses the greater the degree of mental power and capability as we store our mental storehouse with the materials to be manufactured into thought so is the quality and the quantity of the fabric produced it therefore behooves us to awaken from our lazy condition of mind and to proceed to develop our organs of sense and their attendant mechanism as by doing so we increase our capacity for thought and knowledge before passing to the exercises however it may be well to give a hasty passing glance at the several senses and their peculiarities the sense of touch is the simplest and primal sense long before the lower forms of life had developed the higher senses they had evidenced the sense of touch or feeling without this sense they would have been unable to have found their food or to receive and respond to outside impressions to the early forms of life it was exercised equally by all parts of the body although in the higher forms this sense has become somewhat localized as certain parts of the body are far more sensitive than the others the skin is the seat of the sense of touch and its nerves are distributed over the entire area of the skin the hand and particularly the fingers and their tips are the principal organs of this sense the acuteness of touch varies materially in different parts of the body experiments have shown that a pair of compasses would register impressions as a very slight distance apart when applied to the tip of the tongue the distance at which the two points could be distinguished from one point on the tip of the tongue was called one line using this line as a standard it was found that the palmar surface of the third finger registered two lines the surface of the lips four lines and the skin of the back and on the middle of the arm or thigh as high as sixty lines the degree of sensitiveness to touch varies greatly with different individuals some having a very fine sense of touch in their fingers while others manifested a very much lower degree in the same way there is a great difference in the response of the fingers to weight a great difference in the ability to distinguish the difference of the weight of subjects it has been found that some people can distinguish differences in weight down to a very small fractions of an ounce fine distinctions in the differences in temperature have also been noticed the sense of touch and its development has meant much for man it is the one sense in which man surpasses the animals in the matter of degree and the acuteness the animal may have a keener smell taste hearing and sight but its sense of touch is far beneath that of man anaxagoras is quoted as saying that if the animals had hands and fingers they would be like men in developing the sense of touch the student must remember that attention is the key to success the greater the amount of attention the greater the degree of development possible in the case of any sense 
when the attention is concentrated upon any particular sense the latter becomes quickened and more acute and the repeated exercise under the stimulus of attention will work wonders in the case of any particular sense and on the other hand the sense of touch may be almost or completely inhibited by firmly fixing the attention upon something else as an extreme proof of this latter fact the student is asked to remember the fact that men have been known to suffer excruciating torture apparently without feeling owing to the mind being intently riveted upon some idea or thought as wilde has said the martyr born about sensuous impressions is not only able to endure tortures but is able to endure and quench them the pinching and cutting of the flesh only added energy to the death song of the american indian and even the slave under the lash is sustained by the indignant sense of his wrongs in the cases of persons engaged in occupations requiring a fine degree of touch the development is marvellous the engraver passes his hand over the plate and is able to distinguish the slightest imperfection and the handler of cloth and fabrics is able to distinguish the finest differences simply by the sense of touch wool sorters also exercise a wonderful high degree of fineness of touch and the blind are able to make up for the loss of sight by their greatly increased sense of touch cases being recorded where the blind have been able to distinguish color by the different feel of the material the sense of taste is closely allied to that of touch in fact some authorities have considered taste as a very highly developed sense of touch in certain surfaces of the body the tongue notably it will be remembered that the tongue has the finest sense of touch and it also has the sense of taste developed to perfection in taste and touch the object must be brought in direct contact with the organ of sense which is not the case in smell hearing or sight and be it remembered that the latter senses have special nerves while taste is compelled to fall back upon the ordinary nerves of the touch it is true that the taste is confined to a very small part of the surface of the body while touch is general but this only indicates a special development of the special area the sense of taste also depends to a great extent upon the presence of fluids and only substances that are soluble make their presence known through the organs and sense of taste physiologists report that the sense of taste in some persons is so acute that one part of the streichnine in one million parts of water has been distinguished there are certain occupations such as that of wine tasters tea tasters etc the followers of which manifest a degree of fineness of taste almost incredible the sense of smell is closely connected with the sense of taste and often acts in connection therewith as the tiny particles of the substance in the mouth arise to the organs of smell by means of the opening or means of communication situated in the back part of the mouth besides which the nose usually detects the odor of substances before they enter the mouth the sense of smell operates by reason of the tiny particles or the object being carried to the mucous membrane of the interior of the nose by means of the air the membrane being moist seizes and holds these particles for a moment and the fine nervous organism reports differences and qualities and the mind is thus informed of the nature of the object the sense of smell is very highly developed among animals who are compelled to rely upon it to a considerable extent and many occupations among men require the development of this sense for instance the tobacconist the wine dealer the perfumers the chemist etc it is related that in the cases of certain blind people it has been observed that they could distinguish persons in this manner the sense of hearing is a more complex one than in the case of taste touch and smell in the latter three the objects to be sensed must be brought in close contact with the sense organs while in the hearing the object may be far removed the impressions being carried by the vibrations of the air which are caught up and reported upon this nervous organism of the sense of hearing the internal mechanism of the ear is most wonderfully intricate and complex and excites to wonder the person examining it it cannot be described here for want of space but the student is advised to inquire into it if he has access to any library containing books on the subject it is a wonderful illustration of the work of the mind in building up for itself instruments with which to work to acquire knowledge 
the ear records vibrations in the air from 20 or 32 per second, the rate of the lowest audible note to those of 38,000 per second, the rate of the highest audible note. There is a great difference in individuals in regard to the fineness of the sense of hearing. But all may develop this sense by the application of attention. The animals and the savages have wonderfully acute senses of hearing developed only along the lines of distinctness. However, on the other hand, musicians have developed the sense along different lines. The sense of sight is generally considered to be the highest and most complex of all senses of man. It deals with a far larger number of objects at longer distances and gives a far greater variety of reports to the mind than, than any of its associate senses. It is the sense of touch magnified many times. As Wilson says of it, our sight may be considered as a more delicate and diffusive kind of touch that spreads itself over an infinite number of bodies, comprehends the largest figures, and brings into our reach some of the most remote parts of the universe. The sense of sight receives its impressions from the outside world by means of waves that travel from body to body, from sun to earth, and from lamp to eye. These waves of light rise from the vibration in substance of an almost incredible degree of rapidity the lowest light vibration is about 450 quadrillion per second while the highest is about 750 quadrillion per second these figures deal only with the vibrations recognizable by the eye as light above and below these figures of the scale are countless other degrees invisible to the eye although some of them may be recorded by instruments the different sensations of color depend upon the rate of vibrations, red being the limit of the lowest, the violet the limit of the highest visible vibrations, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo being the intermediate rates or colors. The cultivation of the sense of sight under the aid of attention is most important to ail persons. By being able to clearly see and distinguish the parts of an object, a degree of knowledge regarding it is obtained that one may not acquire without this said exercise of the faculty. We have spoken of this under the subject of attention in a previous lesson, to which lesson we again refer the student. The fixing of the eye upon an object has the power of concentrating the thoughts and preventing them from wandering. The eye has other properties and qualities that will be dwelt upon in future lessons. It has other uses than seeing. The influence of an eye is a marvelous thing and may be cultivated and developed. We trust that what we have said will bring the student into a realization of the importance of developing the powers of perception. The senses have been developed by the mind during a long period of evolution and effort that surely would not have been given unless the object in view was worth it all. The eye insists upon obtaining knowledge of the universe, and much of this knowledge may be obtained only through the senses. The yogi student must be wide awake and possessed of developed senses and powers of perception. The senses of sight and hearing, the two latest in the scale of evolutionary growth and unfoldment, must make himself aware of what is going on about and around him, so that he may catch the best vibrations. It would surprise many Westerners if they would come in contact with a highly developed yogi and witness the marvelously finely developed senses he possesses. He is able to distinguish the finest differences in things, and his mind is so trained that in thought he may draw conclusions from what he has perceived in a manner that seems almost second sight to the uninitiated. In fact, a certain degree of second sight is possible to one who develops his sense of sight under the urge of attention. A new world is opened out to such a person. One must learn to master the senses, not only in the direction of being independent of and superior to their urgings, but also in the matter of developing them to a higher degree. The development of the physical senses also has much to do with the development of the astral senses, of which we have spoken in our 14 lessons, and of which we may have more to say in the present series. The idea of Raja Yoga is to render the student the possessor of a highly developed mind, with highly developed instruments with which the mind may work.
In our future lessons, we shall give the student many illustrations, directions, and exercises calculated to develop the different faculties of the mind, not only the ordinary faculties of everyday use, but others hidden behind these familiar faculties and senses. Commencing with the next lesson, we shall present a system of exercises, drills, etc., the purpose of which will be the above-mentioned development of the faculties of the mind. In this lesson, we shall not attempt to give specific exercises, but will content ourselves with calling the attention of the student to a few general rules underlying the development of perception. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Rama Sharaka Chapter 14 The Sixth Lesson Cultivation of Perception Part 2 a mind without stored up material of impressions and experiences would be like a factory without material. The machinery would have nothing upon which to work and the shop would be idle. As Helmholtz has said, apprehension by the senses supplies directly or indirectly the material of all human knowledge, or at least the stimulus necessary to develop every inborn faculty of the mind. And Herbert Spencer has this to say of this phase of the subject. It is almost a truism to say that in proportion to the numerousness of the objects that can be distinguished, and in proportion to the variety of coexistences and sequences that can be severally responded to, must be the number and rapidity and variety of the changes within the organism, must be the amount of vitality. A little reflection upon this subject will show us that the greater degree of exercise and training given the senses, the greater the degree of mental power and capability. As we store our mental storehouse with the materials to be manufactured into thought, so is the quality and quantity of the fabric produced. It therefore behooves us to awaken from our lazy condition of mind and to proceed to develop our organs of sense and their attendant mechanism, as by doing so we increase our capacity for thought and knowledge. Before passing to the exercises, however, it may be well to give a hasty passing glance at the several senses and their peculiarities. The sense of touch is the simplest and primal sense. Long before the lower forms of life had developed the higher senses, they had evidenced the sense of touch or feeling. Without this sense, they would have been unable to have found their food or to receive and respond to outside impressions. In the early forms of life, it was exercised equally by all parts of the body, although in the higher forms, this sense has become somewhat localized, as certain parts of the body are far more sensitive than are others. The skin is the seat of the sense of touch, and its nerves are distributed over the entire area of the skin. The hand, and particularly the fingers, and their tips are the principal organs of the sense. The acuteness of touch varies materially in different parts of the body. Experiments have shown that a pair of compasses would register impressions as a very slight distance apart when applied to the tip of the tongue. The distance at which the two points could be distinguished from one point on the tip of the tongue was called one line. Using this line as a standard, it was found that the palmar surface of the third finger registered two lines, the surface of the lips four lines, and the skin of the back and on the middle of the arm or thigh as high as sixty lines. The degree of sensitiveness to touch varies greatly with different individuals, some having a very fine sense of touch in their fingers, while others manifested a very much lower degree. In the same way, there is a great difference in the response of the fingers to weight, a great difference in the ability to distinguish the difference of the weight of objects. It has been found that some people can distinguish differences in weight down to very small fractions of an ounce. Fine distinctions in the differences in temperature have also been noticed. The sense of touch and its development has meant much for man. It is the one sense in which man surpasses the animals in the matter of degree and acuteness. The animal may have a keener smell, taste, hearing, and sight, but its sense of touch is far beneath that of man. Anaxagoras is quoted as saying that, if the animals had hands and fingers, they would be like men. In developing the sense of touch, the student must remember that attention is the key to success. The greater the amount of attention, the greater the degree of development possible in the case of any sense. When the attention is concentrated upon any particular sense, the latter becomes quickened and more acute, and repeated exercise under the stimulus of attention will work wonders in the case of any particular sense. And on the other hand, the sense of touch may be almost or completely inhibited by firmly fixing the attention upon something else. 
As an extreme proof of this latter fact, the student is asked to remember the fact that men have been known to suffer excruciating torture, apparently without feeling, owing to the mind being intently riveted upon some thought or idea. As Wilde has said, the martyr born above sensuous impressions is not only able to endure tortures, but is able to endure and quench them. The pinching and cutting of the flesh only added energy to the death song of the American Indian, and even the slave under the lash is sustained by the indignant sense of his wrongs. In the cases of persons engaged in occupations requiring a fine degree of touch, the development is marvelous. The engraver passes his hand over the plate and is able to distinguish the slightest imperfection. And the handler of cloth and fabrics is able to distinguish the finest differences, simply by the sense of touch. Wool sorters also exercise a wonderfully high degree of fineness of touch, and the blind are able to make up for the loss of sight by their greatly increased sense of touch, cases being recorded where the blind have been able to distinguish color by the different feel of the material. The sense of taste is closely allied to that of touch. In fact, some authorities have considered taste as a very highly developed sense of touch in certain surfaces of the body, the tongue notably. It will be remembered that the tongue has the finest sense of touch, and it also has the sense of taste developed to perfection. In taste and touch, the object must be brought in direct contact with the organ of sense, which is not the case in smell, hearing, or sight. And, be it remembered, that the latter senses have special nerves, while taste is compelled to fall back upon the ordinary nerves of touch. It is true that taste is confined to a very small part of the surface of the body, while touch is general, but this only indicates the special development of the special area. The sense of taste also depends to a great extent upon the presence of fluids, and only substances that are soluble make their presence known through the organs and sense of taste. Physiologists report that the sense of taste in some persons is so acute that one part of strychnine in one million parts of water has been distinguished. There are certain occupations, such as that of wine tasters, tea tasters, etc., the followers of which manifest a degree of fineness of taste almost incredible. The sense of smell is closely connected with the sense of taste, and often acts in connection therewith, as the tiny particles of the substance in the mouth arise to the organs of smell, by means of opening or means of communication situated in the back part of the mouth, besides which the nose usually detects the odor of substances before they enter the mouth. The sense of smell operates by reason of the tiny particles or the object being carried to the mucous membrane of the interior of the nose by means of the air. The membrane, being moist, seizes and holds these particles for a moment, and the fine nervous organism reports differences in qualities and the mind is thus informed of the nature of the object. The sense of smell is very highly developed among animals, who are compelled to rely upon it to a considerable extent, and many occupations among men require the development of this sense. For instance, the tobacconist, the wine dealer, the perfumers, the chemists, etc. It is related that in the cases of certain blind people, it has been observed that they could distinguish persons in this manner. The sense of hearing is a more complex one than in the case of taste, touch, and smell. In the latter three, the objects to be sensed must be brought in close contact with the sense organs, while in hearing the object may be far removed the impressions being carried by the vibrations of the air, which are caught up and reported upon by the nervous organism of the sense of hearing. The internal mechanism of the ear is most wonderfully intricate and complex, and excites to wonder the person examining it. It cannot be described here for want of space, but the student is advised to inquire into it if he has any access to any library containing books on the subject. It is a wonderful illustration of the work of the mind in building up for itself instruments with which to work, to acquire knowledge. The ear records vibrations in the air from 20 or 32 per second, the rate of the lowest audible note, to those of 38,000 per second, the rate of the highest audible note. There is a great difference in individuals in regard to the fineness of the sense of hearing, but all may develop this sense by the application of attention. The animals and savages have wonderfully acute senses of hearing developed only along the lines of distinctness. However, on the other hand, musicians have developed the sense along different lines. The sense of sight is generally conceded to be the highest and most complex of all the senses of man. It deals with a far larger number of objects, at longer distances, and gives a far greater variety of reports to the mind than any of its associate senses. It is the sense of touch magnified many times. As Wilson says of it, our sight may be considered as a more delicate and diffusive kind of touch that spreads itself over an infinite number of bodies, comprehends the largest figures, and brings into our reach some of the most remote parts of the universe. 
The sense of sight receives its impressions from the outside world by means of waves that travel from body to body, from sun to earth, and from lamp to eye. These waves of light arise from vibrations and substance, of an almost incredible degree of rapidity. The lowest light vibration is about 450 trillion per second, while the highest is about 750 trillion per second. These figures deal only with the vibrations recognizable by the eye as light. Above and below these figures of the scale are countless other degrees invisible to the eye, although some of them may be recorded by instrument. The different sensations of color depend upon the rate of vibrations, red being the limit of the lowest and violet the limit of the highest visible vibrations, orange, yellow, green, blue, and indigo being the intermediate rates or colors. The cultivation of the sense of sight under the aid of attention is most important to all persons. By being able to clearly see and distinguish the parts of an object, a degree of knowledge regarding it is obtained that one may not acquire without the said exercise of the faculty. We have spoken of this under the subject of attention in a previous lesson, to which lesson we again refer the student. The fixing of the eye upon an object has the power of concentrating the thoughts and preventing them from wandering. The eye has other properties and qualities that will be dwelt upon in future lessons. It has other uses than seeing. The influence of the eye is a marvelous thing, and may be cultivated and developed. We trust that what we have said will bring the student to a realization of the importance of developing the powers of perception. The senses have been developed by the mind during a long period of evolution and effort that surely would not have been given unless the object in view was worth it all. The eye insists upon obtaining knowledge of the universe, and much of this knowledge may be obtained only through the senses. The yogi student must be wide awake and possessed of developed senses and powers of perception. The senses of sight and hearing, the two latest in the scale of evolutionary growth and unfoldment, must receive a particular degree of attention. The student must make himself aware of what is going on about and around him, so that he may catch the best vibrations. It would surprise many Westerners if they could come in contact with a highly developed yogi and witness the marvelously finely developed senses he possesses. He is able to distinguish the finest differences of things, and his mind is so trained that, in thought, he may draw conclusions from what he has perceived, in a manner that seems almost second sight to the uninitiated. In fact, a certain degree of second sight is possible to one who develops his sense of sight under the urge of attention. A new world is opened out to such a person. One must learn to master the senses, not only in the direction of being independent and superior to their urgings, but also in the matter of developing them to a high degree. The development of the physical senses also has much to do with the development of the astral senses, of which we have spoken in our 14 lessons, and of which we may have more to say in the present series. The idea of Raja Yoga is to render the student the possessor of a highly developed mind, with highly developed instruments from which the mind may work. In our future lessons, we shall give the student many illustrations, directions, and exercises calculated to develop the different faculties of the mind not only the ordinary faculties of everyday use, but others hidden behind these familiar faculties and senses. Commencing with the next lesson, we shall present a system of exercises, drills, etc., the purpose of which will be the above-mentioned development of the faculties of the mind. In this lesson, we shall not attempt to give specific exercises, but will content ourselves with calling the attention of the student to a few general rules underlying the development of perception. End of Chapter 14 Chapter 15 of A Series of Lessons in Raja Yoga by Yogi Rama Sharaka. Chapter 15 The Sixth Lesson Cultivation of Perception Part 3 General Rules of Perception The first thing to remember in acquiring the art of perception is that one should not attempt to perceive the whole of a complex thing or object at the same time or at once. One should consider the object in detail and then, by grouping the details, you will find that he has considered the whole. Let us take the face of a person as a familiar object. If one tries to perceive a face as a whole, you will find that he will meet with a certain degree of failure, the impression being indistinct and cloudy, it following also that the memory of that face will correspond with the original perception. But let the observer consider the face in detail, first the eyes, then the nose, then the mouth, then the chin, then the hair, then the outline of the face, the complexion, etc., and he will find that he will have acquired a clear and distinct impression or perception of the whole face. The same rule may be applied to any subject or object. Let us take another familiar illustration. You wish to observe a building. 
If you simply get a general perception of the building as a whole, you will be able to remember very little about it, except its general outlines, shape, size, color, etc., and a description will prove to be very disappointing. But if you have noted in detail the material used, the shape of the doors, chimney, roof, porches, decorations, trimmings, ornamentation, size and number of the window panes, etc., etc., the shape and angles of the roof, etc., you will have an intelligent idea of the building in place of a mere general outline or impression of such as might be acquired by an animal in passing. We will conclude this lesson with an anecdote of the methods of that famous naturalist Agassiz in his training of his pupils. His pupils become renowned for their close powers of observation and perception, and their consequent ability to think about the things they had seen. Many of them rose to eminent positions, and claimed that this was largely by reason of their careful training. The tale runs that a new student presented himself to Agassiz one day, asking to be set to work. The naturalist took a fish from a jar in which it had been preserved, and laying it before the young student bade him observe it carefully, and be ready to report upon what he had noticed about the fish. The student was then left alone with the fish. There was nothing especially interesting about that fish. It was like many other fishes that he had seen before. He noticed that it had fins and scales, and a mouth and eyes, yes, and a tail. In a half hour he felt certain that he had observed all about that fish that there was to be perceived. But the naturalist remained away. The time rolled on, and the youth, having nothing else to do, began to grow restless and weary. He started out to hunt up the teacher, but he failed to find him, and so had to return and gaze again at that wearisome fish. Several hours had passed, and he knew but little more about the fish than he did in the first place. He went out to lunch, and when he returned it was still a case of watching the fish. He felt disgusted and discouraged, and wished he had never come to Agassiz, whom, it seemed, was a stupid old man after all, one away behind the times. Then, in order to kill time, he began to count the scales. This completed, he counted the spines of the fin. Then he began to draw a picture of the fish. In drawing the picture, he noticed that the fish had no eyelids. He thus made the discovery that, as his teacher had expressed it often in lectures, a pencil is the best of eyes. Shortly after the teacher returned, and after ascertaining what the youth had observed, he left rather disappointed, telling the boy to keep on looking and maybe he would see something. This put the boy on his mettle, and he began to work with his pencil, putting down the little details that had escaped him before, but which now seemed very plain to him. He began to catch the secret of observation. Little by little he brought to light new objects of interest about the fish, but this did not suffice his teacher, who kept him at work on the same fish for three whole days. At the end of that time, the student really knew something about the fish, and, better than all, had acquired the knack and habit of careful observation and perception in detail. Years after, the student, then attained to eminence, is reported as saying, That was the best zoological lesson I ever had, a lesson whose influence has extended to the details of every subsequent study, a legacy that the professor left to me, as he left to many others, of inestimable value, which we could not buy, and with which we cannot part. Apart from the value to the student of the particular information obtained was the quickening of the perceptive faculties that enabled him to observe the important points in a subject or object, and, consequently, to deduce important information from that which was observed. The mind is hungry for knowledge, and it has by years of weary evolution and effort built up a series of sense systems in order to yield it that knowledge, and it is still building. The men and women in the world who have arrived at the point of success have availed themselves of these wonderful channels of information and by directing them under the guidance of will and attention, have attained wonderful results. These things are of importance, and we beg of our students not to pass by this portion of the subject as uninteresting. Cultivate a spirit of wide awakeness and perception, and the knowing that will come to you will surprise you. Not only do you develop the existing senses by such practice and use, but you help in the unfoldment of the latent powers and senses that are striving for unfoldment. By using and exercising the faculties that we have, we help to unfold those for the coming of which we have been dreaming. Mantram, Affirmation I am a soul, possessed of channels of communication with the outer world. I will use these channels, and thereby acquire the information and knowledge necessary for my mental development. I will exercise and develop my organs of sense, knowing that in doing so I shall cause to unfold the higher senses of which they are but forerunners and symbols. I will be wide awake and open to the inflow of knowledge and information. The universe is my home. I will explore it.
End of chapter 15